So the title of the talk is Uncovering the Mysteries of the Narwhal, and perhaps we'll, we'll do a little bit of that over the next 20 minutes or, or hour and a half. Um, I thought I'd just put up a map to give you an idea of, of what part of the world I'm talking about when I refer to where these animals live. So the, the yellow star, hopefully you all recognize, is, is here in Seattle, and the red box basically identifies uh, Greenland and, and Baffin Island. I don't think I can reach here, but Greenland is the, the big white, basically ice-covered island on the right, and Baffin Island is the smaller island um, that's more brown color on the left. So just a little bit of background, I, I wanted to just tell you, um, for the most part, I'll be talking about narwhals in Greenland, so I thought I'd give you just a couple slides on, on what Greenland is and what the people, who the people are that live there. Um, Greenland is mostly ice. 81% of Greenland is completely covered in ice, and it's basically one giant ice cap that is um, over 1,500 miles long, over 600 miles wide, and about 9,000 feet thick. And basically the only inhabitable part of Greenland is the coastline, which is very, very rocky. You can kind of see some of the brown, brown area uh, there in the photo, and that's a big glacier draining into, into the, the sea. And if we boiled Greenland down to water, we would get about 264 million gallons of water for every person on Earth. So it's quite a lot of ice. So who are the people that live in Greenland um, and, and the Canadian Arctic? Um, these people are, are Inuits who have basically forged a, a very successful relationship with a, a very inhospitable climate, um, which would be the high Arctic. This is a, a photo from a, a small settlement in West Greenland. Um, historically, uh, people uh, have lived here for, for many, many hundreds of, of years, and they, they existed in these this sort of raised areas like a sod house, and you can see there's a, an entrance hole that people actually stayed in during the winter and came out and generally traveled around during the summer uh, f foraging for, for resources. But today, people live in, in houses that look pretty much like what you and I live in, um, for the most part, except they're not always that um, welcoming. So, um, so this is just a, another map that, that kind of zooms into the area I'll be talking about. And uh, these narwhals are, are basically found in, in every place you see on this map. Um, they're distributed in Nunavut, which is the territory of, of Canada, and both on the west coast of Greenland and the east coast of Greenland. And the key areas are really this, this Baffin Bay, you can kind of see um, labeled in the middle, and, and Davis Strait. So who lives in the Arctic and why is that relevant to the narwhal? So um, people living in, in the Canadian Arctic and, and the Greenlandic Arctic are are traditional subsistence hunters. And the reason I bring humans into this, at least in the start of the talk, is because I, I think there's an important relationship between humans and, and narwhals that it's, it's good that everybody sort of has in mind as I, I go about the talk. Um, these three guys are, are uh, narwhal hunters that, that live in Northwest Greenland. Those are handmade kayaks, and they, um, they basically make a living by um, hunting resources, uh, not only narwhals, but a lot of other species uh, uh, throughout the year. And these guys also happen to be um, our assistants. So they, they assist the biologists and, and come on our trips with us and are quite fantastic people to work with. Um, in Greenland, there's about 60,000 people. About 85% of those are, are subsistence hunters. And in Nunavut, which is the Canadian region, there's about 30,000 people. Again, about 80% are, are hunters. And the, the culture of, of, or this relationship with narwhals is, as has gone on for many hundreds of years. I just put this picture up here to show you that this is an image of a, a hunter from 1915. And this is a photo I took in 2005, um, which isn't much different, except he's not wearing polar bear pants. He's wearing a rubber, rubber overalls. So that brings us to the species that we'll be talking about tonight, the narwhal. So the Latin name for the narwhal is monodon monoceros, and that means one tooth, one horn. And for those of you that know what the narwhal uh, is, that is 
probably um, based on the very well-known feature of the tusk, and you can see that here in the image. The tusk is basically a giant tooth that grows out of the left upper lip of the male, and it grows in a spiral fashion, and it can be up to three meters long, so it's nine feet long. And the, the word narwhal actually also has an uh, interesting meaning. Uh, the, the prefix nar means corpse, and whale or veil in, uh, in Old Norse refers to whale. So the narwhal is the corpse whale. And that refers to the coloration of the animal. And you can see here it has this like gray and white mottled pattern, which unfortunately re resembles a drowned sailor um, that may have been pulled out of the water. And so thus they got named after, after that. So the narwhal tusk has been the subject of interest for, for centuries. Uh, the Vikings, uh, when they were exploring the North Atlantic, they went to Greenland and they returned with narwhal tusks and told great stories about what animal they came from. And that's actually the source of the myth of the unicorn. So um, that's, that's where we all got the idea of a horse walking around with a big tusk. Uh, trade in narwhal tusks continued through uh, the 18 and 19 hundreds um, with whalers who would go up to the Arctic and look for large whales like bowhead whales and then return with, with tusks and sell them all over the world for many different reasons. Um, tusk trade is very regulated today. There's actually a ban on export of tusks from Greenland and, um, and not very many tusks are exported from, from Canada but I just thought I'd show a couple images to, to show you how really influential this animal was. Um, this is a, a painting from about 1600 of the unicorn, which we all know was based on the narwhal. And this is a really fantastic throne you can find in, in Copenhagen, where Denmark's King Christian V built an entire throne out of narwhal tusks. So every single one of those sort of long poles you see is actually a piece of a narwhal tusk. So it was, it was very prestigious to have pieces of this, this exotic animal. So I thought I would just include a couple slides on what the tusk is really for because I think that will probably be the first question I get as soon as this, this 20 minute talk is over. And so I thought I'd walk through a couple of options or sort of theories people have put out. Um, the first idea is do they spear fish or spear their food? And you might notice from this image, this narwhal actually happens to have a fish stuck on the end of its tusk, which is complete, a complete accident. But its mouth is also down here. And you can imagine if your dinner is stuck two meters in front of you and you have no hands, it's not very convenient. So it wouldn't be very practical to have your tusk be for spearing fish. And what about breaking ice? You know, maybe they kind of use it as a chisel to open up a hole so they can breathe. And we actually have pretty good evidence that, that they can, narwhals can break ice. It's, it tends to be very thin ice. But what they actually do is they come up with their, their um, back and push, push the ice up and create a small hole. And those are these pockets you see here uh, that uh, I took a photo of this standing on the ice. So the tusk is not for that. Um, so what is the tusk for? There are a lot of other theories. Um, uh, Herman Melville actually wrote that the tusk could possibly be a letter opener. So many people have had many interesting ideas. But a pretty smart guy named Charles Darwin came up with, um, spent a lot of time pondering the narwhal. And to just to skip this quote and come down to the key point, which is what we call in biology sexual selection. So basically, when animals have a very flashy, fancy appendage, and it tends to be the males that have that appendage to attract females, um, it's very common in the animal kingdom, and that's essentially what the narwhal tusk is. Narwhals use their tusks for um, competition between other males and for essentially um, dis deciding who's dominant and who should get the get the woman. And it's not that different from the feathers of a peacock, which you can see a very beautiful blue male in the left, or the mane of a lion. So I thought I would include a couple slides on how we do research on narwhals, because um, this, this is, can be kind of fun and interesting, and, and it takes a little bit of creativity to actually learn something about these, these animals. So. Um, for the most part, we study narwhals in the summer, and that's because in the summer, the Arctic is light. 
there's occasionally some sun, there's no sea ice, and you can actually access the whales because they come close to shore. And this is an image of a, a typical field camp we might, uh, we might stay in for, for three to four weeks. Basically, we identify a site where we know there are narwhals. We fly in with this, this, this airplane as a twin otter, and you can see it has these big tundra tires that basically allow it to land in, in any surface. And they dump all of our stuff in a big pile and fly away and come back four weeks later. And we make a small camp and, and, and do our work. Um, this is our camp, a camp I've, I've been in for maybe six or eight years now, and this is a, a summer photo. So, um, The alternative is you can live on a boat, and you can actually access areas um, that narwhals inhabit if you are mobile on the water. And so this is a, a boat, this red boat here, being loaded by this kind of creative approach uh, in northwest Greenland is a boat we lived on for... Um, about four weeks uh, for two years in a row and basically we we took this boat and sailed for about 48 hours into north greenland dragging our our two inflatable boats behind us and we were able to to find a site where we could we could access whales and this is where we we ended up so that was the the august of 2006. Um, a lot of people ask what do you do when you're in these remote areas with um, yeah, it's sort of uh, luxuries of, of our everyday life, like restrooms and bathing. We tend not to have restrooms because you can see here one year we actually built one, and that's this, this small outhouse uh, standing in, up there in the, in the photo on the left. But you have to be pretty brave to go in and shut the door with yourself inside because you happen to have polar bears basically walking by continually. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to be in a small box with those walking around. Bathing, you tend not to take a shower or you create something out of a bucket. One year we, we did actually invent a, a shower you can see here, uh, which is, is, um, is rare, but is possible. Or you can be extremely brave and run in for about five seconds. And um, cuisine, cuisine, we tend to, so these are a group of, of hunters I work with uh, every summer, and we tend to eat a lot of traditional food, although you don't see that in the photo here. Um, whatever they might catch or, or hunt, we'll, we'll often serve and cook. Um, and uh, that can vary from a number of species of birds and fish and caribou and seals and whales. So studying the narwhal, um, I have to say after 10 years of studying this animal, I think it's probably one of the worst study animals you could choose. Uh, because they spend basically most of their life underwater at very deep depths. They tend to be several hundred kilometers offshore, and they really love very dense sea ice. So none of those things are very practical for a biologist trying to learn something. Um, so we've had to be pretty creative, and um, the, one of the main sort of approaches we've used for studying these animals is what we call satellite telemetry. And what you're looking at is a, a small transmitter that's about the size of a deck of cards. And that transmitter has two AA batteries and a microprocessor. And uh, it also has a, a, a pressure transducer so it can measure the depth. And all of that information is sort of summarized and sent up through this, an this black antenna you see here um, to satellites. And so if we are able to catch a narwhal and put one of these tags on the narwhal, we can actually learn a lot about what they do because these tags will tell you where an animal moves every single day and what they did underwater, so how deep they dove, how much time they spent underwater, different things like that. This is just a schematic of how that works. Hypothetically, you have a narwhal with a tag, and that, that tag sends transmissions to polar orbiting satellites. So there are lots of satellites going overhead all the time. And if you have uh, your transmissions picked up by enough satellites, it can basically sort of triangulate where that animal is on the surface of the Earth and send that information to a receiving station. And that information is then compiled and sent to me here at UW. So I can basically sit in my office at UW and follow narwhals in Greenland but that all depends on if you can catch one. And so how do you catch a narwhal? Um, basically, you set a very big net, really large net that is uh, maybe 30 meters deep and 
uh, I don't know, 100, 200 meters long. And you put buoys on top, like you see here. And you sit and you look at that net for a really long time, many, many weeks. And just to give you an idea, we basically have to have a 24-hour watch of this net. So, I mean, you don't want an animal to drown, so you're watching the net constantly to see if one goes in. And to get an idea, this is our entire summer, the dates up here on the top, and a 24-hour watch on the, on, the, um, on the left. And the star is where we caught a whale, and everything else is where you sat and stared at the net. So there's a lot of waiting. And the waiting can be quite nice. This is just a situation of some of us sitting and waiting for narwhals to show up. But after weeks and months of that, if nothing happens, sometimes we have some serious depressions in our field camp. <laughs> So um, before, um, I would say actually, we mostly catch icebergs, and that's um, a problem because an iceberg can take your net away very quickly. For every one narwhal I've caught, must have also caught 200 icebergs. And so you spend a lot of time rearranging the icebergs with your small boats, and I just thought I'd show you a few pictures of that. Varying techniques of lassoing the iceberg, pulling it out of the net, or just pushing for a really long time to get it out of the way. But occasionally we do actually catch a narwhal and basically an animal goes in the net and it's very obvious, the buoys go under, there's a lot of hysteria, everybody rushes out and the key thing is to get the whale up to the surface as fast as possible. And this is a female uh, that we, we captured and, and once they're free of the net and at the surface we, we restrain them um, for about 30 minutes and we put a transmitter on their back uh, attached to their, their dorsal ridge and you can see us doing that here. And those transmitters give us a lot of information. This is a map that shows you uh, movements of narwhals and for every color, every color represents a different population of narwhals that we've tracked. Um, or we've captured and, and tracked. And the key thing is you can see that the colors sort of originate up in, in the top part of the map or the high Arctic, and those animals move out of those areas into offshore Baffin Bay and Davis Strait. And that's where they spend the winter. So those, that's what we call their wintering grounds, whereas these coastal areas where I have the, the labels and the dates um, is what we call our summering grounds. I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer and I'm kind of stuck, so I can't, I can't point very well. Um, so um, so these, these tags have taught us a lot about what, what these whales do, and uh, not only where they go, so the migration maps I just showed you, but also what they do underwater. And what we have learned is that these are some of the deepest diving whales um, in the world. Narwhals dive up to 1,800 meters uh, 15 to 20 times per day. So they're basically diving to the bottom of Baffin Bay over and over and over again. That's a pretty extreme behavior, and you might ask, well, why on earth would you do that? And it's because these whales feed on flatfish, which are Greenland halibut that live at the bottom of the sea. So they basically have to go to the bottom to access the fish and then go back up to get a breath and go back down to get another fish. So it's a pretty, um, a pretty intense period and it lasts for about six months. To give you some uh, idea of really what, what, how intense that is, so um, 1,800 meters is about 4,500 feet. And if we take the Space Needle, which we all know well, and pile up eight Space Needles uh, on top of each other, that's about one narwhal dive, just to give you an idea of, of, of scale. Um, and our record is, is almost 6,000 feet uh, diving depth, so over one mile. So um, hopefully you've all eaten because this is a little bit gross, but that's part of biology. So how do you find out what these, how did we find out these whales are eating halibut? Well, what we did was we accessed, um, because these animals are, are hunted for subsistence, we have access to samples. We can sample whales. We can look at their blubber or their muscle, and we can look at their stomachs. And so some lucky person can, can actually look inside a narwhal stomach, and they're pretty cool because they have these, these finger-like folds that capture all of the prey that they eat, and the prey are digested down, but the hard parts, like fish ear bones, which are these small white circle, circular things you see here, or squid beaks get caught in the stomach. So you can actually take out these hard parts and figure out what size fish narwhals are eating, what species fish narwhals are eating, same thing with squid, and sort of reconstruct the diet, and also reconstruct how much they eat. 
So we've done that, and um, just to be, well, this is actually the job, not a very popular job of going through the stomach down here, but to summarize, basically um, what we found is that narwhals feed very intensely in winter. The stomachs are always full. Um, there's a lot of fresh, fresh remains of halibut. Their stomachs are never empty. In summer, when we look at stomachs, they're for the most part empty. So we don't really think narwhals eat very much during the summertime. And that explains this very intense diving behavior. So um, I just want to have a, a couple of slides about the, the ice because the narwhal's relationship with sea ice is, is very, kind of very important. Um, narwhals, when they, when they make a migration out of these submarine grounds, they actually depart ahead of the sea ice. Uh, this is a, a graph my colleague Harry Stern made for me here in the audience. Um, and these whales, they, they leave early, usually at the end of October, and they tend to move ahead of the ice. And the ice is what you see here in these multicolors. So that's the sea ice that's forming in the fall as the Arctic gets colder and darker and things freeze over. And in wintertime, they, they find their wintering grounds and they stop, and the ice basically surrounds them. So they spend the entire winter in very dense ice. So some work, recent work we've done is try and count how many narwhals are out there or just estimate what the densities of narwhals are. Um, in, in, in marine mammal biology, we call these aerial surveys for abundance, but I think we can also just call it how we estimate the number of narwhals on the wintering grounds. So we take that same airplane, that twin otter, out 200 kilometers from shore with a long-range fuel tank so we can get home, and we fly uh, with observers that are positioned in the airplane and look out the window and count whales. Um, and at the same time, we record, we have a hole in the bottom of the airplane with a video camera that records what the ice is like and also looks to see if there are any, basically records the track line, the, the line that we're flying on to see if we miss any narwhals. And um, this is just a map of what that would be. So you originate here uh, in, in West Greenland and you fly for two hours offshore to get to where these narwhals live. And then you do as many lines as you can and count as many whales as you can and then you get home before you run out of gas. Um, and um, what we, when we've done that, we've actually found, this is all really recent information, um, we found some pretty interesting things. So we, we surveyed one of these wintering grounds and, and estimated about 19,000 narwhals in this survey region or this box. But when we look at the sea ice in that region, we can actually see that, that most of that area is completely ice covered and only 2% is open water. And these whales are mammals and breathe oxygen, so they, they need open water to breathe which means that these whales are tightly packed into these cracks in the ice at a density of, of over 73 narwhals per square kilometer, which is pretty neat. We can also look at, at images to show us basically um, what kinds of habitats narwhals like. So this is very old ice with these ridges, and this sort of lighter uh, gray region is what we call new ice or light ice that narwhals can actually break. And then this black region, you see open water. And if we zoom in, we can actually see two narwhals in that open water. We've also gone through um, images that have no open water, and we see evidence of whales using this very new ice and, again, breaking these breathing holes with their back. So you can see those bumps here. So it's a, it's a tedious job, but it basically allows us to document what kinds of habitats these whales live in. And that's just the photo I, I showed you earlier of how they break that ice. And my last two slides are just to mention um, kind of an important thing for narwhal biology is what we call sea ice entrapments. And these are pretty interesting events. Um, so this, this species is really good at being in the ice and, and very skilled, but they're not always on top of things. And what can happen in the Arctic is conditions can change very rapidly and an open area can freeze over quickly and trap a lot of whales and basically limit or reduce or eliminate their access to oxygen. And we have a number of, of these cases documented throughout basically the past, past 100 years. Um, these are just some tusks that were collected from a very large ice entrapment of over 1,000 narwhals in 1915. And that's, everyone asks that narwhals aren't stuck in the ice with their tusks sticking out. They actually have, have been pulled out of the ice and the tusks have been removed. And not only um, is access to oxygen a problem, but of course when you're stuck in a very small hole, you can see that some uh, creatures like polar bears show up and like to pull you out and, 
and eat you. So this is um, pretty interesting, and I, I just thought I'd mention, I don't know if some of you read about this in the news, but um, in 2008, there was a very large ice entrapment in, in Nunavut uh, on Baffin Island where over 500 narwhals were trapped uh, in the ice and, and died. And so we're, we're right now really trying to understand why these ice entrapments happen and sort of document the frequency and, and if there are any patterns uh, at all. So I think that my time is up for this talk and now you can drink some beer and then ask some questions. <laughs> is the narwhal a uh, endangered species? And if so, uh, during these ice entrapments, are any efforts made to rescue them? So the the can you hear me? The question is: Is the narwhal an endangered species? Um, that's a kind of a tricky question because in the U.S. we have this uh, this thing called the Endangered Species Act. Um, but narwhals actually don't occur in any U.S. waters, so they're not technically classified as endangered. There are other um, national acts, like the uh, Canada has its own its own act, and Greenland has its own. And the narwhal is listed as a vulnerable species, but it's difficult to say how it, how that translates to whether it's endangered or not. Um, and the question of whether any efforts are made when there's an ice entrapment, I would say. The answer is no. Um, for the most part, these ice entrapments, they're not that frequent. Um, we, the last entrapments we had in, in Canada and Greenland were in the early 90s. And so this, this recent one in 2008 was kind of a surprise to everyone. And usually what happens is they, they decide if um, the, the uh, local people that live where the ice, around where the ice entrapment occur, is occurring, if they should harvest those whales, and they would be part of their, basically their, their quota. So for the most part, the, the whales, before they sink, are harvested. Did you have a question too? Yeah. Are they, do they have a pod structure, much as other whales? And in that area, that's where they used to hunt, you know, the big whaling days, the great right whale. Are they interactive, or do they don't come that far north, or? Yeah, so much of the Arctic exploration was driven by um, whaling for large whales, and the right whale actually occurs a little bit farther south from where the narwhal is, but a, a close relative of the right whale is the bowhead whale, and that's the Arctic's only baleen whale, and that whale does overlap with the narwhal, and actually a lot of this, um, a lot of the whalers that came from Europe and came looking for these bowhead whales, you know, for, for the, the large whales themselves, would then take some narwhals on the side. Um, so, and you, your first, you had a question. Oh, the pod structure. So his question was, what is their what is their pod structure like? Um, so we, the answer is, they narwhals travel in pods. The pods can be um, all males, they can be all females, they can be mixed sexes. They're really variable. Um, we don't, honestly, there's a lot of questions that you may ask tonight that we just don't have the answer to because these whales are so elusive and difficult to study and one of those is really what you know how are what is the structure of the pods and how are the whales related and it's very very difficult to get that information so um, yeah um, I was just wondering about your telemetry devices like after you put them on how long do they last yeah so um, the question is how long do the satellite tags last and the longest lasting tags we've had um, go for about 14 months. Those were really great and s sort of a record. I would say uh, more frequently they last about six to eight months. And basically what those tags do is they, they fall off the whales and they sink to the bottom and then that's the end. So. Narwhal, do narwhals use their horns for defense? The, the question is, do narwhals use their horns for defense? That's a good question. Um, so I, I would say they, that narwhals don't do anything on the order of like sword fighting or fencing or, or you know, any really violent, aggressive activities. Um, that you can definitely see two males interacting at the surface with their tusks, so they're often their heads are out of the water and they're crossing their tusks and sort of 
touching them and going underwater and coming back again, but it, it tends to be pretty gentle. Although um, I should say that there, there was a study maybe 20 years ago that suggested that narwhals have some scars around their head and those may be caused by interacting with other males and sort of getting a scar from the tusk. But I, I think for the most part, it's not too aggressive or mean. Are there any projections as to how global warming in the future may affect the narwhal populations in terms of retreating ice and uh, uh, less sea ice and so on? Yeah, so the question is about how will global warming or climate change affect narwhals. And that's, um, I could talk about that for another 20 minutes. Um, but the, you know, the short answer is there's two, there's sort of two aspects of climate change. There's the fact that you have this ice and it's retreating and these whales are used to living in the ice. Um, so basically, w what will they do if, if the ice isn't present where it normally is? We don't have the answer to that. Um, we're, we're looking at some of those questions right now and, and we think that these whales actually they're very predictable in that every year these narwhals go to the same places because they're good places to eat. They're reliable fish, you know, they, they basically can get the nutrition they need. And what it looks like is that the choice of where they go may not so much be affected by the ice, but more by where's a good place to get the fish. So, um, but the, the other aspect of climate change is, is, you know, the ice disappears, but also the whole system changes. So the temperature, the, the ocean temperatures warm, the currents change, the, the, spe the fish species, the other animals that are normally present move north or move out. And um, that's, a, that's also a difficult question because that could be a bigger effect on narwhals if this reliable Greenland halibut resource that's, you know, in Baffin Bay and in good densities that they feed on suddenly isn't there or the densities change or it's not as predictable simply because the whole system is warming. Um, so those are two things we're really looking at, but I, I, I wouldn't say we have any concrete evidence to say this is exactly what's happening. It, it takes decades to collect the information, so it's kind of a long-term job. We have a question from back by the bar. Uh, can a male narwhal survive without his tusk? Uh, yeah, a narwhal can survive without its tusk. Um, I've seen I've seen narwhals with broken tusks and broken quite sh like large adult males that I don't know what they ran into or what happened, but they basically the whole thing is sheared off and um, nobody knows really how painful it might be, but they can definitely survive. Yep. Should I give you? I I don't really believe the uh, the um, sexual dimorphism story of the narwhal tusk, the, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it, it looks so much like an antenna, and could it be a, potentially a, uh, a form of telecommunication for the narwhal? I mean, it's sonar? Do, do they, do they uh, have sonar? Well, um, I mean, I think the main thing to, to consider with the narwhal tusk, and it's sort of a subject of fascination, is that females almost universally, with a few exceptions, don't have tusks. So whatever this tusk is for, it's not for something that's critical to surviving, like communicating or finding food or finding oxygen. So um, the, the way narwhals communicate, they're, they're tooth whales, which are, are called odontocetes, and they, they have sort of a, um, a, like an oily sac in their head, it's called the melon, and they send out uh, echolocation clicks. They basically send out, like, pulses of sound and receive those back in that melon and, and navigate. And they communicate with whistles and chirps and strange sort of buzzing sounds. So um, I, I wouldn't, I don't think it has anything to do with communication. I guess, I guess uh, a follow-up question to that is how do, how do they catch the halibut once, it's, once they get down there? That was my other guess is that, you know, maybe there's something, uh, because most sea creatures can sense elec um, electricity in the water. Maybe it could amplify. Yeah, so this, this halibut is kind of a cool fish. In it. If I had a photo, I'd show you. And most, most flatfish, they're lying on one side, and both of their eyes on the, are on the one side of their head, right? So they have no, eye, no eyes on this side and two eyes on this side. But this Greenland halibut is strange in that it's, 
And when these, these, these fish, they, they start with eyes on two sides of their head, and the eye basically migrates all the way around and ends up here, so kind of weird. But the halibut, it never really migrates all the way over, so they have one eye on top of their head and one eye on the side of their head, but that means that they don't lie flush or flat on the bottom. They can actually swim like a normal fish in the water columns. They can swim sort of oriented vertically, and I think that that actually facilitates like a narwhal going down and, and basically being able to scoop them up. But honestly, we, nobody, has any, nobody has any idea what happens at you know, 5,000 feet below the sea and how they catch the fish. But that's one idea is that because they're not true flat fish, they might be a little easier to catch. Yeah, you need a submarine and a lot of money. I was curious about the halibut, the relationship between the halibut and their movements and the narwhal and their movements, because you mentioned that in summer, they're not, the narwhal are not feeding. Is that because of some sort of disjunction between the two? Yeah, so, um, you know, there have been some fishery scientists that have t actually tagged halibut and looked at their movements. And, and what they see, um, the halibut that are in Baffin, well, I'll start, halibut, fish are recruited, so they're sort of larval, like forms of fish that get sort of, taken up with currents and then they, as they grow and mature into yeah. big fish, they get deposited into certain areas. And these halibut are, are what we call recruited in South Greenland and they move up and they get dumped into this deep abyss of Baffin Bay. And they tend to be pretty stationary. They never really make it out of that abyss. They, they stay there. And that's what makes that area a very good place to feed because you basically show up and you know you'll get fish. Um, in summer, the, in some areas of coastal Greenland, there are halibut. There, there actually are halibut available for narwhals to feed on, but um, definitely not in, not in the Canadian Arctic. There's almost nothing in these summering grounds. They're very barren. So, but I think the, the lack of feeding in summer is more of like a sort of seasonality, uh, uh, just sort of evolutionary thing that's occurred where they just, they basically pick a predictable time to feed and they don't feed when it's not that predictable. It's a good strategy, actually. So, when do they mate? They mate in, in March, April in the ice. So you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, can they sense the thickness of the ice in any way, like sonar or something like that? Um, I, I, nobody's really studied if they can, with, you know, with sound, if they can actually sense the thickness of ice. I think more likely they, um, they test the thickness of the ice with basically trying to break it. I mean, I think these animals are, they're very good in ice and they know when they're in a habitat that's pretty open or has very thin ice. But um, like those photos I showed you, they, they basically come up and, you know, and try to break it. I've also seen uh, some areas where, where whales will just keep a, a region open by basically two or three whales will constantly surface. And if you just keep surfacing and you take turns, you keep, you know, keep the ice open. But I don't, I don't know that any, anybody's really established that they can sense that. My turn. Um, do nar won't the horns get in the way when they're trying to hunt for those fish? Do the, so the, the comment is: Do the tusks or the do the tusks get in the way when they're trying to hunt? And that's a good question. Um, we. We, we don't know. Obviously, they, they seem to be able to catch fish with the tusks, but there have been some studies where people have put tags on whales and they can look at their orientation, so you can see basically when a whale dives, how it turns. Um, and those studies show that narwhals, they like to swim upside down. And you can see that from the air when you're flying over them and they, they figure out you're up there. They'll dive and they'll flip over upside down and swim down, which is kind of strange. But it, it actually may be a smart strategy if you have this giant thing stuck on the top of your head to swim upside down where your mouth is sort of the, the thing that's facing up. Because so their mouth is right, you know, basically underneath their head. Um, so, but we, we don't know how much the tusk gets in a way. Are the tusks related to the whale's age at all? Do they continue to grow? I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? Uh, do the tusks continue to grow throughout the whale's life? Um, so the, this is actually, I can use this image here. So this is a, a picture of a very young male narwhal that uh, I took a, a couple summers ago. And you can, see, you can see right here that it has a very small tusk. And that whale is um, 
probably about one year old. So the, the calves are born, the male and female calves are born, they look the same, they have no tusk, and it starts to grow at about one. And it basically, um, it, 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 it grows very fast and then it, the rate slows down. So they, the, the tusks do grow throughout the animal's life, but it's, it's a very small amount that they grow. I mean, it's, it's negligible, essentially. But, they, but in, the, in the early stages of the animal's life, that grows quite fast into it's, you know, nine feet long. We have a question from the back by the bar. Um, how much do narwhals weigh? Um, well, a male weighs about 1,200 kilos, um, and a female weighs maybe, maybe 800 or 900. So. I read an article in a National Geographic uh, maybe a year ago about uh, rifle hunting that goes on in northern Canada for the, for the narwhal. I think it's the tusks, although I'm not totally sure if it's tusks or, or meat um, that they're hunting. Can you tell me what you know about that and what kind of policies are going on in Canada um, regarding that policy? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a very good question. So uh, as I told you earlier, narwhals are, are a resource for people in the Arctic, and so they're hunted annually by people in both Greenland and Canada. And um, the techniques vary. So in northwest Greenland, they, they use the ultimate traditional methods where they make a kayak by hand, and they, they make a, you know, a harpoon by hand and tie a rope to the harpoon, and they blow up a seal skin and turn it into a float and, and actually cast a harpoon at a whale. When you cast a harpoon at a whale, you almost guarantee that you will get that whale because you've attached a rope to the animal and a big float, and so it's, it's hard to lose. There are other methods where uh, uh, hunters use rifles, and you can shoot a whale from a boat, or you can shoot a whale from the ice edge. And um, in Canada, they, they, they tend not to use harpoons, they use rifles. And so there was a, she's referring, there was a National Geographic article that, that documented the narwhal hunting in Canada um, a couple years ago. And basically, you know, if you stand on the ice and you, you shoot something, you're not guaranteed that you'll, you, you might kill it, but you're not guaranteed that you'll actually land the whale, which means you'll get it on the ice and, and uh, sort of be able to, to use it. Um, that's a, that's something that is a concern um, for many scientists and managers, even in in, um, in Canada and Greenland, and, and really something I think the Canadian government is working on documenting better how you know good or bad their techniques are and um, how they can be improved. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely something that needs to be considered when you're hunting and hunting any animal that you, you use a good practice. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, what is a tusk made of? And um, have, has it ever been uh, a, a camera been tagged on a narwhal? An you said camera? Ca yeah, underwater okay. camera. It's a tag. Yeah, so the tusk is, is ivory. Um, it's it's a big, just a big ivory spiral um, tooth. It, and uh, basically... Um, you know, there, there are two of there are actually two of these these teeth in the head of a narwhal. Narwhals have no teeth in their mouth. If you open their mouth, they just have gums. It's kind of kind of funny. But they have these two teeth, and one always grows on the left. And every once in a while, you have one grow on the right, and then you have a double tusked narwhal, which is pretty cool. Um, and the question about have we ever put a camera on them? That has been done. Uh, we did that in the summer, and it wasn't very a very exciting movie because you you know you you basically you put a camera on a whale with a suction cup, so you just stick it on and hope it stays on for a couple hours and and record things. And um, you know it came up for air and it went back down. And it gets dark and then it came back up for air and then it went back down and it gets dark. But you don't really see that much, so and it wouldn't win an Oscar. Can you tell the age of a narwhal from the spirals on the tusk? That's a good question. How do you age a narwhal? Um, 
So a lot of mammals are aged from their teeth, right? And you can slice a tooth in half, and it's just like if you cut a tree, and you can look at the growth rings on a tree and basically figure out how many years it's been alive. Well, mammals tend to lay down layers in their teeth, um, and so you could technically count, you know, count the rings or count the layers and say it's X number of years old. A narwhal tusk is kind of tricky, and there hasn't been a whole lot of success in, you, you know, you need a whole narwhal tusk. You can't look at an animal and count the spirals. If you took a tusk and sliced it down the middle, you know, you might be able to have some kind of estimate of how old the narwhal is. But the, the best method people have used, and it's very recent, it's only the past couple years, is um, to age narwhals is when they're hunted, uh, you get the eyeballs from the hunters. And you take the eyeballs back and you actually dissect out the eye lens. And the eye lens has uh, basically these these two, uh, two, I don't know what I want to call them, two chemicals that sort of, uh, as the animal ages, they shift in the ratio of the one chemical to the other chemical. And so you can actually look at, it's called aspartic acid, you can look at the ratio of, of that aspartic acid uh, over time and compare it to a newborn and estimate the age. And uh, recently, narwhals, the, the, that technique has been used, and narwhals can be up to 90 years old. And that was a real surprise to us because before when we just looked at these layers on the tusk or kind of guessed at what it might be, we thought it was like a beluga whale which lives to be about 30 or 40. So it was a really interesting discovery. Um, how did you get involved with studying narwhals and what path would you recommend a student going down in order to get involved with Arctic research or narwhal research? Um, I think that actually, I think there are a lot of opportunities for students to get involved in Arctic research now. I mean, um, even more than when I got involved uh, as a student because climate change is such a big issue and there's so many studies and concerns around the Arctic. And, and um, so I think that, you know, if a student's interested in Arctic science, I don't think it's that tricky to find um, opportunities. Uh, I got involved in narwhals. I had actually been working in Alaska on... Uh, on beluga whales for a couple of years and uh, basically I, you know I had developed some skills that I could apply to some narwhal data that a, a colleague invited me to help analyze and then I it turned into my PhD and my postdoc and my job and everything but um, uh, yeah I mean I, I think I think there's a lot of opportunities for students these days so Um, I was a little confused about um, whether the um, Greenland versus Canada and whether they take the narwhals for meat and for the tusks. It sounded like one of them was allowed to do some trading in the tusks and one of them wasn't. Can you elaborate? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, narwhals are hunted in both countries. Right now, uh, there's a, what we call an export ban on tusks from Greenland. So any narwhal hunting in Greenland isn't driven by the fact that they can take the tusk and, and send it out of the country. Uh, the narwhal hunting in Greenland is, is uh, pretty heavily um, based on the idea that they eat the whole animal. And they eat the whole animal. I mean, I've been there and they eat the, the skin and you know what they call the muttuck, which is like a layer of blubber. They eat the meat, they eat organs. Um, the whole thing disappears, just a skeleton in the end. Um, in Canada, my, my understanding is they, they can still export tusks from the Canadian Arctic. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know how many, I don't know what the rate is or, or the numbers per year. Um, and the, the hunt is also subsist, it's a, certainly a subsistence hunt and I know that they, they very much value the muttuck. So that's like the, the outside of the narwhal and, and then this, this blubber layer. Um, from, when I've been there, they haven't eaten that much of the meat, but I, I think that could be really variable depending on where where you go in Canada, so how much of the animal they use varies. Yeah. Um, what is the complexity of the communication between the narwhals with their clicks and their whistles and stuff? And I was also wondering how far away can they communicate with each other underwater? Yeah, those are good questions. And that's actually something we just started working on is um, acoust narwhal acoustics. There have been a couple, there were a couple studies in the 1970s that, you know, put a hydrophone in the water and recorded some clicks and sort of wrote down what the what the frequencies were. Um, but we don't we don't know very much about how they communicate. We 
we, we did make some recordings the past two years out in the ice, and it seems like their communication in the ice or the sounds they make is quite different from what they do in the summer when they're in the coastal areas. But that's a whole, that's a whole area of research that needs to be explored. So I won't, I won't tell you any lies, I'll just say that. <laughs> You know, you're stuck somewhere because of bad weather. You don't go there for three days. So it tends to be three to four week periods of time that y you would have a field project. Um, but it varies. So, I mean, uh, we, we've done a lot of this satellite tagging. So we've, we've moved around to, between different populations and caught whales and put these tags out. But we've also, um, you know, had projects where we just fly in an airplane and count whales or where we fly a helicopter out and land on the ice and make recordings or it's, it's really, really pretty variable, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, carrying on about the, the question about the, the tusk trade. Uh, I know in Alaska, native hunters take walrus tusks when they, when they hunt the walrus, and they're not allowed to export or sell the tusks, but they are allowed to make artworks or artifacts from them, and those things they are allowed to sell. Is it similar in Greenland? Yeah, it's very similar in Greenland. So in, in Greenland, uh, the hunters, they, if they catch a whale, they can't send the tusk out of the country, but they can make art out of it. And they're very skilled, actually quite fantastic artists. I mean, I've seen hunters sit with a Dremel tool and chop off a piece of a tusk and make just an amazing carving of a bear or a whale or um, make a piece of jewelry, a ring or earrings or something like that. So they, they, they do make art out of the tusks, but that, whatever that is, art or jewelry stays in Greenland. So, so it can be sold, you know, it can be sold to different people throughout the country, but it can't be exported. Uh, now, you're from the University of Washington, and who else is doing this research? Canada? Any of the other countries involved? Uh, yeah, so uh, other people studying narwhals. There, um, there are government scientists in Greenland and Canada, that, and, and some in Denmark, that study narwhals. Yep, yep. I think we have time for another question or two. Do you have one up there? Where do you get your funding? Uh, where do we get the funding? So uh, we, we write proposals to science agencies that, that can be uh, the National Science Foundation of the US. It can be NASA. They've funded uh, some of our work where we look at movements of whales in the ice. Um, the, the, the US military actually funds some marine mammal work. It's called the Office of Naval Research. So they, they provide a lot of support for marine mammal studies and some has come from there. Um, and some has actually come directly from the Greenland government. But it, it varies, it goes up and down. So I'm a, I'm a kayaker and uh, I was just wondering what chance does a kayaker have of getting out of a pack, a pod of narwhals when there's 76 narwhals per square kilometer? <laughs> and what, what's their behavior like around here? Um, well, so the first question is if you're in a kayak in a density of 70 something narwhals per square kilometer, what would happen to you? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but that is out in the ice, so you would have to, you know, put your kayak in a, tw in a helicopter, fly yourself three hours from shore, and launch yourself in a very small lead. So it wouldn't be very practical. Um, and, or, well, yeah, you, you, maybe more like a dog sledge. Um, what was, tell me again, you, you had a second question? What's their behavior like around humans? Oh, their behavior around humans, that's a good question. They, they, well, in Greenland, they basically do everything they possibly can to avoid humans. And they're extremely sneaky. And they, if they have any indication that, in, that somebody, a boat, or anybody's around, they're gone. Which is another reason why they're pretty bad study animals. So they, you see them sneaking along at the surface, and then you, know, you make a little noise, and bloop, they're gone. And then you see them 20 minutes later, like kilometers away. Um, in Canada, they actually behave a little bit different. You can... Uh, you can, they come closer to shore and they're, they're a little bit less afraid. So um, you might have a better chance of kind of interacting with one. But for the most part, they, 
they're very elusive and they'll avoid you. All right, do we have any more questions? Okay, one more. If you, oh, if you had to guess, how many narwhals do you think there are like total in the world? How many, how many narwhals worldwide population? I would say there's less than 100,000. There's probably about 80,000 narwhals in, uh, in Canada and West Greenland. And we don't know that much about the narwhals in East Greenland, but, but maybe another 10,000 or something. So. Oh, we have one more way in the back. Hang on. How, is there a loss rate to, to that number uh, annually, or do, do they produce more than you lose? Is there a percentage to that? Gross is there number? a loss rate to what number? The species. To, you know, you have uh, X amount of narwhals. Do you lose a percentage of that population annually? That, yeah, that's a tricky question. I mean, I think you have to take that on a population by population basis because some populations are, are growing, so they have a, a, a a growth rate that increases the number while others may be uh, over harvested or have other problems and are actually declining. So it's, it's, it's kind of tricky to answer on a worldwide, worldwide scale. I would say in general, it's a positive growth rate that it's, things aren't so dire that that, that number is going down. I don't recall if you've already said this, so if you have, I apologize. How long can they stay underwater before they have to come up for air? Um, we, well, so our satellite tags measure the duration of these dives, and the, the technology isn't as smart as the narwhals because the, the technology at the moment only tells us basically if they were underwater for more than a half an hour. And so we can see that many of these dives do last more than 30 minutes, but we don't know the maximum duration. We just haven't been able to measure that because of, yeah, technology problems. Quick question. Have you ever eaten narwhal? Yep. Yep, I've eaten a narwhal. Mm -hmm. it, it depends what part of the narwhal. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the muttuck, so the skin and the blubber is the is extremely expensive and considered a delicacy. Um, and it's very, very rubbery and you basically can't chew it. And you almost have to just kind of gnaw on it for a little while and then swallow it. Unless you cook it. If you cook it, then it's pretty soft. And the meat is, um, the meat is very, very dark and rich uh, and it's almost black in color because these, these deep, dive, deep diving animals, they, they um, have a lot of myoglobin in their muscles and it binds oxygen and then it just makes the muscles very, very black color. Um, the meat's kind of somewhere between like steak and liver maybe. Doesn't taste of that, but the consistency. And um, I can't describe the, the flavor, but it, it makes you extremely warm. When you eat it, you actually, s you start sweating. It's just so rich that you'd like have to take off your layers of clothes to eat it. So. It's a good, you know why, why people have survived on, on this whale in the Arctic, because it's, it's a good food up there when you're freezing cold and your meals are pretty far apart. Well, I think we'll end on that note. Um, so let's take a moment to thank our speaker again.